Well, thank you very much indeed um, uh, for giving me this opportunity and to taking part. I thought that Pierre's presentation was very inspiring indeed and uh, leading towards uh, what uh, is needed going forward. So my presentation and now, again, some disclosures. That's important because I'm going to talk about some uh, some um, compounds in the, in the course of my talk. Um, that I'm focusing on here is first two parts. The care of HD, the relief of symptoms and signs. So if you like the symptomatic treatment, the goal of the symptomatic treatment or the care is to help to live with the disease. And I, in my years now working with HD, I have come to believe that that is the most tangible, the most concrete thing we can achieve. And here we can achieve quite a lot. I will briefly review the tools for you, the various therapeutic options both pharmacotherapy and non-pharmacological treatment options. I think in particular social workers are crucial for helping people and not affected as well as their families in living with the disease. And then I will close with an, an outlook, an outlook on the future where we are hoping to make headway to modify the relentless progression of HD by interfering with mechanism of disease. And I will review for you the current status of experimental approaches. That's a, new, an, a hope for all of us new, who work in Huntington's disease, all the families, and, and also, I believe, an inspiration new, for moving new, in the Arab countries fast, to be in the position to um, join in in both the development and the application of these future therapies. So let's start with the care for HD. We have heard in the previous presentations that there are a range of symptoms and signs. And with Huntington's disease, and I, they're listed here, and, I, and you heard all of them discussed in the previous presentations. What I would like to emphasize here and is that some of them, the motor features and the cognitive features, tend to display a progressive decline, whereas the very disturbing and often very severe and disruptive behavioral alterations, and some of them at least, tend to be episodic. So it's a different an approach needed for the various aspects of the um, phenotype. So how should that look like? Let's start with a concrete example. This is a case study, a patient in the Huntington traditional stage three and three, four, and so and that's a person who's already no longer able to live independently. That's reflected in reduced functional capacity to work, to handle finances, to perform chores at home, and, and to take care of himself, and, and to live independently. So, and the motor impairment in this particular patient and was and moderate to mild. So bradykinesia and dysarthria being the and a, and a features along with some degree of dystonia, more prominently hyperkinesia with some problems in walking and postural instability and a cognitive decline. And, but not a very severe one at the moment in somewhat depressed mood. So the real problem here for this particular family was the psychosocial uh, issue. And it, the family and it was, um, uh, had to be hold, held together 
by the mother who had, in addition to her affected husband, um, had to um, take care of three young children, two young adults or adolescents and her sick husband. And, and she had to cope with the fact that um, her husband um, ha, ha, was forced to stop working and had no income um, because of Huntington's disease. Um, and um, the uh, financial issues were pretty uh, pressing for the family. So if you look at this pretty typical on a situation for families. The one and the thing I owe this particular case example to a colleague of mine, Katrin Reitz from Aachen, and this particular example illustrates, I think, very, very clearly that professional psychosocial support is probably one of the most helpful ways to allow the family that I described to you to live with the condition and to cope with their various problems. So Martha Nant, who is a very experienced an HD clinician knew with a big heart, and put this together, and I think it's helpful. It's, as she calls it, the HD molecule, and it shows you that aside from the patient, in the very core, you see it here, PhD, you have the family, the spouse, the at risk, the extended, and all the issues, and not only the medical care issues, but also the, the family issues, and the, how to manage crisis, how to prepare for the future, and the, that are on the mind and of and the families affected by HD. For that reason, you do need a multidisciplinary care team. And I do say this because it's important to realize that you will see, depending on your background and depending on your education, you will see different aspects and the patient and the family will relate different aspects to you. A patient will talk differently to Alzbeta, a psychiatrist, than to a neurologist, or they will again talk differently to a psychologist or a speech therapist, or a social worker, or a dietitian. Only all things together, the whole, is approaching the entire reality, the truth, if you like, of living with Huntington's. To my mind, therefore, multidisciplinary care is essential and needs to be organized. I alluded to the fact that you have several domains. I uh, specified four, the movement disorder, behavioral syndrome, cognitive syndrome, and the metabolic disturbances. And the way how we work in the clinic, and Michael Orth uh, alluded to this, is sort of, if you like, ex phenotypical expression array, where we review carefully in our clinical visits the various domains of concern and sort them into green, which implies no problem, yellow or orange, and a milder or somewhat more severe problems, and red burning problems that needs to be addressed instantly. And so what you end up with is an array of these traffic light signs that indicate what you as a physician or as a care team in an HD center needs to focus on. What we often have to deal with are psychiatric problems and, and all the other issues listed here. And I, and I think it's important to stress that we can do quite a lot. So low mood can be, by currently available methods, in, can be improved pretty well. Likewise, irritability and aggression and it can be treated in many patients with quite some success, even long-term success. Sleep problems can be addressed and fixed. Weight loss, the appropriate dietary measures and the appropriate and a, and style of living can be adjusted, lost weight can be regained. 
Chorea as one prominent aspect of the movement disorder can be suppressed to some extent at least, and the ability to move around overall can be improved not only by pharmacotherapy, might also stress the importance of physiotherapy in this context. And that's quite important, quite close. So the clinical reality that we face and the worldwide, I would say, is that many patients are on multiple drugs. The most popular, interesting enough, are SSRIs. I believe mostly because of the problem of irritability. And then obviously dopamine receptor antagonists and they are widely used to address the problem of chorea. They come with a price, that's quite clear, and I allude to it a little bit later. And then there are dopamine depletors like Dutrabent. So from my perspective, only there are a fair number of unmet needs in ameliorating symptoms and signs by pharmacotherapy, and I very briefly will highlight a few of them. One is that we would love to have a, a, a pharmacotherapy that allows n, to n, relieve hyperkinesias without worsening bradykinesia or inducing cognitive slowing, a feature that does exist in the disease to start with, and that we aggravate by attempting to ameliorate hyperkinesia. So that's an unmet need. And if big unmet need, essentially one of the biggest from my perspective is to define and to initiate interventions in prodromal stages of Huntington's. This is the stage where uh, people uh, lose their jobs. This is the stage where uh, families fragment and, uh, and break apart. So, and that has to do with uh, behavioral and cognitive issues, while motor uh, signs and symptoms uh, are less prominent at this particular prodromal stage. And it's quite important that we improve on our ability to come up with helpful interventions. Most important and desirable, of course, is that we can change the natural history. That is, can attenuate the rate of progression and to finally, hopefully, even delay clinical onset. And there are luckily a fair amount of options that I'm going to review for you. And if you like, they can be classified into broader categories. Here you see in the upper DNA as a target, and you can see RNA as target, you can see protein, the Huntington protein as target, and physiological processes. Michael Hayden will speak to this a little bit later, that are altered in the course of Huntington. Um, so uh, let's uh, quickly review these exciting uh, new avenues that are opening up. And I would like to stress they're still all experimental and, and need to be tested in a rigorous fashion in randomized clinical trials. So uh, let's pre briefly review the approaches to one of the options to reduce the further production of mutant Huntington gene products in silencing. In principle, a treatment that would be and could be applied to all dominant hereditary disorders. And it, the way it works is uh, that we address uh, or attack the uh, issue by focusing on mRNA, so the transcription from the DNA, that's at least uh, the most frequently used method. I'll show you other methods a little bit later. And by reducing the mRNA level, the instructions, if you like, the building instructions for the protein products to be made, we reduce the protein products, that is the polyglutamine expanded hunting team as well. And we have a range of tools in our armamentary. A range is important, and I'll review with you some of them, how they work. And it's important that we uh, intervene early in the chain of events, because that is um, coming with the promise of large effect sizes. Not necessarily fast results, but large effect sizes. 
up to the point that we can even delay the emergence of clinical symptoms and signs. So here are some of the, the uh, intervention points that I'm depicting for you. So you, on the right, you see the mutant hunting team gene product. And here you see the mature mRNA. Here you see the pre-mRNA with introns still on a, around that get out of the nuclear compartment here in gray once the, the introns are spliced out. We have now various modalities that and it can interact. Main side of an, uh, an uh, uh, attack of single-stranded DNA molecules referred to as antisense or nucleotides are here the pre-mRNA and in the nuclear compartment you have RNA-based molecules and that and, uh, can and, uh, bind to and degrade the mature mRNA and you have small molecules and this year one clinical trial, dose funding trial by Novartis is going to start and uh, that interfere with uh, splicing processes and help to degrade the mRNA by uh, translation related decay. Then you can go even more proximal, this is not this year, but potentially next year, the first study starting, that's proper gene therapy, where a zinc finger binds to the CG repeat expended mRNA is coupled with the repressor and reduces in a gene selective fashion you know, the production of mutant hunting gene. And in principle, there would be ways to correct the genetic defect. In my opinion, that's further away from clinical applications. And then there is a new category, and that is somatic instability. I presented to you that um, the reality that um, the DNA size, and Michael Hayden in his presentation um, re-emphasized this, is not the same um, in the body. That is something that is unstable in the body. And several companies are engaged in preventing these further expansions in the hope of preserving a tomorrow for people affected with Huntington's disease. And there are even on the horizon examples where contractions may be induced by small molecules. So pretty exciting times for us where we eventually and a hope to modify the natural course. I showed the slides, a similar slide to you previously, by following the proper genetic test and, and the appropriate intervention, and altering the disease course to the extent that the slope of decline is modified in a major way, or even and the um, emergence of symptom signs delayed in a substantial, tangible way. That's our hope for the future. Thank you.